And so like if we're at like a different church, like Lutherans, we can clap for that. You got like four people like, yeah. <laughs> Hercules, Herc, sorry. Um, if you're new with us, my name is Jason. I'm one of the pastors here at Zion. It is so great to have you here with us. Um, a, couple, a couple things. Uh, if you're new with us, if you're exploring faith, maybe you've been hurt by the church and you're just dipping your toe back in. Maybe you're looking because you moved into the community and someone invited you. Or maybe you're just here for the summer and you want to normally you go to church in the park. Whatever reason why you're here, we're so glad that you are. Uh, for our regular Zion attenders, for our, our peeps out there, our volunteers, leaders, all those who make this home, I want to thank you personally for making this a safe place to belong. A place where people can come and experience the radical, life-changing grace of Jesus. Uh, some pretty remarkable things are happening right now. Um, we, are, we strive to be a place of belong, believe, and become where you don't have to believe to belong. And because here's the thing, we understand that sometimes there's doubt. Sometimes we have questions. And here's the thing, God's not afraid of questions and neither are we. Doubt is not always a bad thing. Unbelief is a bad thing. Amen? And, and so if you're wrestling, if you're trying to figure things out, my hope, my prayer is that maybe you can find a safe place here, even if it's just for the summer or maybe you're looking, we hope you'll find it. A uh, couple things, point of, of clarification. So today we are celebrating 150 years of ministry for Zion. Can we give a thank you for what the Lord has done there? Now, here's the thing. We're not actually celebrating Zion. We're celebrating Jesus because it's 150 years of Jesus ministering into a community. It's not about us. Amen. And my prayer is that, because here's the thing, there are no churches in the New Testament that are still alive today. None. Every single church in the Bible died because every church has its life cycle. And so that's why we don't celebrate a church. We celebrate the work that Jesus is doing because at the end of the day, it's God's kingdom that prevails, not a church. Amen? And so my prayer is that we have another 150 years. Um, but regardless, we want people to know Jesus and know what we're about. And so today we're having, it was supposed to be a block party outside. And like I said earlier, I've never prayed for rain more than right now, just because how miserable we'd be we're inside and it's beautiful outside. But I'm trusting God knew what he was doing. I don't need to know. But we want to invite you after this service. We've got games. We've got food. It's going to be a fun time. Please come and hang out with us. Join us as we celebrate 150 years of God moving in Clear Lake and prayerfully for 150 more. Uh, we are in week two of our summer series called This Is How I Fight, where what we're exploring is how, how do we better understand the world we live in and the battle raging in the unseen, invisible world around us that the Bible calls the heavenly realms. Now, by show of hands, how many of you are a little weirded out by this idea that there's an unseen realm, an invisible realm, and an invisible enemy? Am I the only one? Okay, thank you for you honest people out there. I look at that and it's weird because here's the thing. My entire life, what I was taught, what most of us were taught in a Western culture is what's called empiricism. Empiricism says that the only thing that exists is what you can see, what you can hear, what you can touch, what you can taste, what you can smell. And yet the Bible reveals to us is that there's so much more than that. And here's some of the evidence that we can't always rely on what we can see or hear or touch, what our senses allow us to see. Wind. You actually don't see the wind. What you see are the effects of the wind, right? You know that wind is there because you feel it on your skin, but you don't actually see wind. For thousands of years, they had no idea about these things called viruses and bacterias, and it wasn't until later science allowed them to see that there was a world that they couldn't see. Here's what the Bible posits. Here's what the Bible tells us, is that there is another world that we do not see. It is an unseen realm with an unseen enemy, and that we physically see the effects of that invisible realm. When we look at the world around us, what we've seen in the last week, what we've seen in the last several months, years, I truly believe that the reason why we're seeing an uptick in violence right now is that there is a spirit, there's a spirit moving particularly in our nation right now. And I believe that if we're going to fight that, yes, there are things that we can physically do to fight that, but we need to go to the ultimate source, which is to defeat the lies of the enemy in the unseen realm. And that's what this series is all about. Um, in the 90s, in the early 90s, or late 90s, early 2000s, 
One of my favorite movies was any movie with Adam Sandler. Do we have any Adam Sandler fans in here? I loved Adam Sandler. I, I thought, I mean, he had a string of just brilliant movies. And every single movie, you had Billy Madison, Happy Gilmore. True story. My son and I, he was about 10 years old, were watching Happy Gilmore, which is the story about a hockey player who un unwittingly becomes a PGA golf player. Two very different sports. And we're watching it. It's comedy. And my son turns to me and he goes, Dad, is this based on a true story? <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, why, yes, it is, son. Yes, it is. <laughs> when, and, I mean, we all know it's not, but I mean, it's a great story. Uh, the Wedding Singer, The Water Boy, Miss Big Daddy, Mr. Deeds, 51st States, Grown Ups. I mean, the strings just kept on coming in. And every single one of these Adam Sandler movies, they always had one guy, he cast his friend, who always did one thing. Show it for me. Do we have the clip? Someone? Yeah. Okay, here's what I wanted. Ready? How many of you guys know that guy? Ready? Everybody say it with me. You can do it, right? I mean, here's the thing. We all know that cheerleader. And here's kind of, I, I actually asked the staff. I'm like, okay, here's what I want to do. This is like the Adam Sandler comedic version of amen in the church. And so I'm like, I think I'm going to encourage everybody. Instead of saying amen, just say, you can do it. And they said, that's a bad idea. Uh, and I agree with them. But I mean, it was funny because it'd be amazing. And then, you can do it. Matt, don't do that. Matt's already thinking about ways to do it. And here's the thing. We all want cheerleaders in our lives. We all want people, and that's how Adam Sandler understood it. He knew that at the right moment, when the, the final touchdown needs to be made, when the girl needs to be got, when, when things are at the part where that moment when you need to do it, you need that voice that says, you can do it. But here's the reality. Most of us don't have that voice, much less in our head, do we? We don't have somebody, I mean, how many of you guys know it, that, that subtle voice inside of you that instead of offering words of encouragement says things like, you can't do it. You're worthless. You're a fraud. If only people knew. You're unlovable. This voice that creeps into our ears that reminds us of our past sins, our failures, our deepest insecurities, and it always knows right when to strike, doesn't it? It always knows that moment when it, that voice comes in. And here the, the world wants you to tell you, or at least Disney does, that you have a little cricket, a subconscious that says, you can't do it, right? It's that little thing. But here's the thing. I do believe sometimes these voices are internal. They're, they're lies that have been spoken over us. Now, there's a, an equal problem that has now existed, and it's moved into a newer generation, which is now bringing a, a different lie, but it's of the same sort, which instead of saying you can't do it or you're worthless, it's you're awesome. You're incredible. You're practically perfect. Hey, you can fail. You'll still get a trophy. And we chuckle a little bit, but think about what it's doing to our culture. On both sides, you have one side who thinks too little of themselves, another side who thinks too highly of themselves, and, and both are losing, helping us lose the battle, aren't they? Because the truth is, is that there is a, a more tricky and a more insidious lie, a lie that all of us have believed at one point, and it says this, you can do whatever you want to. Whatever makes you happy, whatever brings you pleasure, whatever feels best, who cares about anything else? As long as it doesn't hurt anybody, you can do whatever you want. Now, all of these are ultimately lies. How many of you know those lies that I'm talking about, right? How many of you have that voice in your head that sometimes speaks things over to you that you wish were not there. It knows how to speak to those core lies, those false stories that have defined your life and who you believe you are. Here are some of the lies. You're not good enough. Be better. I'm only worth loving if people need me. I need others to see me as successful or I'm nothing at all. How about this one? I'm alone in this world. No one understands me. I must have all the answers. I can't appear dumb or ignorant. I must live in fear because fear keeps me and those I love safe. No one really cares about my needs, so I have to take care of them myself. I can't appear weak or vulnerable. I don't need anyone because people will let me down. And here's one that I hear quite often. I need to make everyone happy, just don't rock the boat. 
How many of you, when you heard that list, at least one of those spoke to you? You kind of went, yeah. They're called core lies for a reason, and they're sadly lies that we believe. And here's the thing about a lie. When a lie gets a hold of us, when it takes root, when they grab a footing in our lives, when you buy into the lie long enough, they actually become your truth, a false truth. It's a lie that will grab a hold of you. And the Apostle Paul actually talks about these lies. He gives a word for these lies to help us better understand them. And this is how the Apostle Paul describes them. He calls them strongholds. Strongholds are the lies, the stories, the beliefs and philosophies and behaviors that hold us captive. Now, uh, if you have your Zion app. We normally have slides, but because we weren't supposed to be indoors today, we don't have it right now. But if you have your Zion app or Facebook, or if you want to turn to your Bible app, uh, we have our scripture for today. So I'm going to give you a minute. Everybody pull that up. Would you stand with me as we read our text for today? And if you're looking for it on your Bible app, it's going to be found in 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 through 5. I'm going to give it a second so that people can find it on their phone. Would you say this out loud with me if you have it in front of you? 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. The word of the Lord, praise be to God, you may be seated. I want to tell you, um, so this is actually a two-parter in this series called This is How We Fight on Spiritual Warfare. Today we're going to be talking about how do we recognize the lies, the strongholds in our lives. How do we know when we've got them? How do we know when that seed has been planted? Next week, we're going to look at how we take captive our thoughts for the Lord. How do we find victory over what God has done. And so here's what I'm going to ask. I'm going to encourage you, would you come next week? This week, we're going to talk about strongholds, how we discover them. Next week, we're going to be looking about how do we capture our thoughts? Because here's the thing about the enemy. The enemy understands something. He understands that by planting that seed, that small lie, eventually that lie will grow into something big. And when those lies become truths for us, they lead to things like anxiety, Fear and worry, doubt, confusion, anger, sadness, envy, shame. Now, I want to make this clear, and we've talked about this before, but if you're new, I want you to hear this. Sometimes people have mental health issues. Not all of them are demonic, okay? I want you to hear that. Sometimes there's brain chemistry going on, and it's not a matter of a demon possession or demon oppression or whatever language you want to use. It's that we live in a fallen and broken world, and sometimes, often... What we need is help. We need a counselor. We need therapy. But what if? What if the enemy is so wise, so sneaky, that you might already struggle with anxiety or depression and he plays on that lie? That yeah, there's a physical component, but there's still a spiritual enemy that wants to bring the worst out of that moment. How many of you would agree with that? So other times I do believe that there are times and instances that what is taking place is not a mental health issue, but a spiritual health issue. And we have to be wise and understand that if you you just broad brush everything and say, oh, it's all physical, we ignore the spiritual. Or if we say it's all spiritual, we neglect the fact that we live in a physical world, don't we? And so here's what I do know, is that when these strongholds take place, they're called strongholds for a reason. They imprison your heart, soul, and your mind. They impact not just you, but your relationships, your relationship with your friends, with your coworkers, with your spouse, with your children, even with God or even yourself. These strongholds, when they're unchecked, these lies become fortified prisons that hold us hostage. And here's what I know. There are many of you in this room that I've talked to personally who are struggling to defeat the strongholds in your life. And I can tell you, for me, I'm still battling some of them. There are are strongholds in my life that I'm working with the Lord, and and some of them went through therapy and counseling. Counseling is a beautiful thing. 
but there are things that I have to come to the Lord and say, okay, God, this is a lie that has followed me for, for decades. And here's what I'm discovering. See, next week we're going to be talking about generational sins and curses, things that follow down, that are passed down to us, that sometimes we don't even know where they came from because they came from people before us and were passed down to us. These are things that the Lord wants to bring victory. By an amen, how many of you want to experience victory in your life? If so, say amen. amen. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to start looking at how do we discover these strongholds? Where do these lies actually come from? Now, again, the skeptic, and if you're skeptical, that's okay. Please hear me when I say this. It is really okay if you're like, I don't know if I believe in all that unseen stuff, Jason. Cool, I'm just glad you're here. The skeptic wants to say it's just all in your brain. It's hardwiring. It's an evolutionary development that allows you to feel guilt or shame or whatever it is so that you can fit into society. That's what the skeptic might say. That's what evolutionary science might say. But this is why I appreciate the Bible. I believe that the Bible gives us a fuller, a better picture of why we fight this battle so consistently. And what if, and I want to pose this, what if, it's more than just your head talking to you or the voice of someone you loved who spoke something over you. What if that voice is actually an enemy who knows your weaknesses better than you do? What if it is an unseen enemy who not only wants to destroy you, but to keep you from the life and freedom that God has called you to? Because Jesus is called to bring us life, amen? Amen. And this is one of the many reasons why I believe that the Bible, it helps me make sense of things in the world that the world just doesn't have satisfactory answers for. For instance, here are some of the lies that seem to be perpetuated for thousands of years. The how might have changed, but the why of evil still exists. For instance, before there were guns, people used swords. Before there were swords, people used stones. Before there were stones, people used fists. Why? Because the real issue isn't the stone or the gun or any of those things. The real issue is the evil heart that exists within humanity. Would you agree with that? And what we need to get past, that's, no, I'm here, I appreciate the clap, I really do, but here I want you to hear this, is that sometimes we're so focused on fighting against the physical that we, we have to realize that the real heart of the issue is the brokenness of humanity. This is what the Bible tells us. The Bible tells us, now that doesn't mean we don't, we don't have to be wise about these things. It means that we must understand the source, the source of why these things continue to exist. Here's the thing, greed has always existed. Maybe before they were greedy for money, maybe they were greedy for, I don't know, sheep or pigs or whatever, I don't know. Some of you farmers are like, I still want lots of corn, that'd be great, Jason. Greed has always existed. Lust, control, power, rage, anger. These have always existed after the fall. That's not how the, God, how the God we love and believe in, the God we serve, the God we worship, that's not the picture he paints. It wasn't originally that way. It all started with an enemy who lied, who twisted and perverted what was good in the garden and as a result brought death into the world. So what do we do when we find these strongholds in our life? Because the root of evil doesn't change. The sin and the lies that we believe that lead to these sin came from the father of lies, according to Jesus, which is the devil who is seen in an unseen realm, when we, one we cannot see. Here's the crazy thing. You realize that through all the self-help books, all the therapy, all the laws that we legislate, guess what still happens? Murder, affairs, brokenness. Because you can't legislate a spiritual reality, can you? There has to be something else. There must be another point. Now, here's the part I want you to hear. Please, if you're not listening to anything else, hear this question. What if the reason that you keep losing the same battles in your life is because you're not fighting the right enemy? What if the reason that you keep on experiencing loss after loss is because you're not fighting with the right weapons? You're fighting through the flesh, you're fighting through your own ability, and you're not going to the source of victory. I want you to hear this. For years, I don't mean one or two, I mean over a decade, there were certain lies in my life that I tried to white-knuckle my way through. 
and then I'd fail again, and then I, it was like that, remember that hang in there, stupid cat on the poster, hang in there, buddy, right? Here's the deal, I don't have claws to dig in, so my fingers are getting tired, and, and I remember feeling, I just felt so defeated. There are many of you in this room who feel defeated right now because you're battling the same things over and over, and I'm here to tell you that in Jesus' name, there is victory, it is possible, but it doesn't come without a cost or without some effort. There is something going on. Your enemy understands this. This is the one thing that Satan understands about all human beings. It's one truth. You guys ready for this? He knows that if he can capture your thoughts and mind, he's captured you. That's where the enemy is going for. He's going for your mind because once he's got your mind, he's got your body. Once he's got your thoughts, once he's got your beliefs, he's got you. And so going to the gym, lifting weights, doing all the diet programs, that's great. But unless you deal with a lie here, this is still going to work itself out in the wrong way, isn't it? We need something different. We need to learn to fight differently. I'm going to quote from a guy named Tony Evans. He's a pastor who writes a lot on spiritual warfare. Now, this is what I discovered. So I, I was coming prepared to, I was like, okay, Lord, we're going to do the spiritual warfare series. I feel like this is what you want me to do. And okay, so I, I've, I've read Ephesians 6 I, hundreds, if not thousands of times. I've taught on it before. But here's what I felt like the Lord was saying to me as we were preparing for the series. This is going to be different. It's not just about the armor of God. It's about all the other ways. And so as I started reading, I love to research. Anybody who's been to my library, I like books. Books are my friend. And so I had, okay, true story. I had somebody who came into my office and said, Jason, you have way too many books. And I went, no such thing. And here's what I started doing. I started reading, and I had a pile of books about this high. And then as I began to kind of seek the Lord, I started, and reading, I started realizing that this wasn't enough. Now I have a pile of books this high. Because spiritual warfare is so much more than we realize. There were things that as a pastor, I was not realizing were spiritual warfare. I thought they were just formational questions. But here's the thing. Spiritual formation is a spiritual warfare issue. Did you catch that? If you want to be more like Jesus, that is a spiritual warfare thing. And so just reading Ephesians 6 is not enough. We need to get into the armor of God, yes, but if you don't know what the enemy is you're fighting, what good is the armor of God? We need to understand how and when. And so Tony Evans, again, pastor, great. I really have enjoyed his work. He points out four strategies that the enemy uses to get you into a stronghold. How many of you guys are ready for this? If you're ready to say yes. Okay, here we go. Here are the four strategies. Now, I watch this. These aren't from Jason Miller. They're also not from Tony Evans. They're straight out of Scripture. Tony just had the wisdom to look at it and go, oh, here's the word. I like that word. Ready? Okay, so here's the first one. The first strategy is desire. Desire is actually a good thing when it's in the right place. It is beautiful and holy that I desire my wife. It is. But what happens when that desire turns from my wife to another woman? That's sin. It is holy and good that I desire to be a great father to my children. That's a holy desire. But what happens when that desire gets twisted? It is a great thing when my desire is for the Lord. And here's the crazy part. When you begin to desire God, when you begin to say, God, I want you to be my utmost desire, He begins to change your desires. Listen to what Psalm 37, 4 says. Take Delight in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. The problem that many of us face is we think God wants to answer every desire. So we'll say things like, well, it says if you ask in my name, I'll give you anything you ask for. Yes, if it aligns with the desires of your heavenly Father. But what if it's coming from the Father of lies? My desires need to be transformed, conformed, informed, by the God who is holy. Amen? And when they're not, what ends up happening is I get deformed desires. We need transformed desires. And so here's what the enemy does. The enemy begins to twist what is a good thing, desire, and he makes it an unholy desire. Let me give you an example. Uh, there's nothing wrong with desiring food. If you're hungry, eat. But what happens when you desire too much food? Now you have gluttony. We need, as human beings, we need rest. What happens when that desire for rest rules over us and now that rest becomes laziness? 
Or how about sex? Sex, God created us for intimacy and connection. There's nothing wrong with desire of sexuality in the right context, biblical marriage, what God has designed. That's holy. What happens when it moves outside of that? It leads into adultery, idolatry, and immorality. Satan knows that if he can twist your desires, he can get a hold of you. Listen to what Evans writes. Satan's initial strategic point in our lives is to play on a legitimate God-given desire within us and twist it into something illegitimate. He wants the desire to be the master over you rather than you being the master over your desire. Here's why this matters. Strongholds never start off as strongholds. They start off as innocently as a basic good desire or need. There is absolutely nothing wrong with desire. I'm going to use a physical world illustration, and I have a feeling this is going to speak to more than a few of us here. Is there anything wrong with desiring a good job and a good paycheck? No. You need money to survive, right? It'd be awesome if we didn't, but we do. Here's what the enemy does. The enemy knows, because the second part of desire, how he gets you, is he wants to deceive you. He plants that little lie inside of you. And, and I can tell you, this happened to me personally. When I was younger, this is went through my head. If I could just make 200 bucks a week, I'd be set. I was like 10. <laughs> and then it was like, you know, if I could just make 20 grand a year, that's all I need. And then what happened? I made 20 grand and all of a sudden, what did I need? 30 grand. And then 40. Now here's where it really gets insidious. You guys ready for this? Satan will come in and say, you know what you need? You don't have enough. You need more money, which means you need to work more. So you need to put in more hours. And so instead of working 40 hours, just put in 50. It's just this one weekend, just this one weekend. You don't need to worry about going to church. You don't need to worry about being home just because you need to make more money because here's where the lie really comes from. Here's the deception, especially as parents. Well, you need, I want to be a good dad. And you know what a good dad? I want my children to have all the things I didn't have. And you know how they get those things is more money. And so I'm going to work more. I'm going to put in more hours, more time. Also, my kids can do traveling sports so they can do this and that and this and that. And I'm not going to be present for any of it because I've got to feed the wrong desire of thinking that money solves the problem. That slight twist got a hold of me. Do you think my children at the end of the day really care how much traveling baseball they play or do they want a present dad? It starts with that small desire, doesn't it? And in fact, we'll twist it because once Satan deceives us, He's done his work, and then we do the rest of it for him. We deceive ourselves. He eventually, he'll whisper that. Now, here's the scarier part. Sometimes the way Satan deceives you is not by deceiving you, but somebody you trust who will speak to you what he can't say. Let me give you an example. Maybe Satan didn't come to you and say you need more money. Actually, it was the next door neighbor who you keep on trying to compete with, whisper to them, and Satan knows the better way to get to you is to get to your neighbor. Or the better way to get to you is to get to the person next to you in church. See, Satan is called wise for a reason. Now, here's the thing. The enemy schemes, he's smart and he's crafty. I want to share, last week we shared the story. Uh, we talked about Elisha, and Elisha, he gets surrounded by this, this vast army. And his servant wakes up in the morning, and he looks out, and he sees they're surrounded by chariots and soldiers. And his servant wakes up Elisha, the prophet, and goes, Elisha, we're surrounded we're surrounded. And Elisha looks at him and goes, I don't worry about he who's with us is greater than he who's with them. We're fine. And then he prays that the Lord would open the eyes of his servant's mind. And as he looked up, all of a sudden he sees this huge army of chariots of fire surrounding them. Elisha had eyes to see. This morning, I want to talk to you about King David. See, here's the thing about King David. King David started off as a shepherd, the youngest of his siblings. He loved the Lord. He cultivated, he was formed in his worship, his alone time with the Lord. And the Lord strengthened him and the Lord protected and provided for him so much for, so that David fought off lions and bears protecting his sheep. And then one day David finds out that there's this giant name. What's his name? Goliath. And the Lord sends, David's like, hey, you don't dishonor the Lord. And David picks up a sling and throws a stone. And yes, David threw the stone, but it was the Lord who directed that stone and he slays his enemy. Eventually, David becomes king. And when David is king, for the first part of it, he understood who fought his battles. He understood that the Lord was his strength and his shield and his might. And everything that happened, he attributed to the Lord. But eventually, like happens to so many of us, David forgot that. And in one verse... First Chronicles, listen to this, check this out. 
First Chronicles, David does something that we, it seems so silly. First Chronicles 21.1. Satan rose up against Israel and incited David to take a census of Israel. Really? That's, that's the big sin? He takes a census? Here was the problem. David's entire reign as king, even before that, his strength, his might came from the Lord. It didn't come from him or his armies. When he took that census, the reason why Satan was involved is Satan took a desire which David wanted to be a good and a great king. And guess what? He was, when he was honoring the Lord, he was the greatest king in Israel's history. And Satan brought a, a slight lie that twisted him that said, hey, David, good kings count their armies because it's armies that win battles, not the Lord. See how big your army is. See how big your military might is. And David did that, and that undid everything. 70,000 soldiers died in the next battle. Here's the thing, and I want you to hear this. Some of you are taking a census of your finances, of your jobs, of your hobbies, of your marriage. And, and here's what I mean by that is that you're not relying on the Lord's provision and strength. You think it's all about what you do. And guess what? When the enemy strikes that little lie into you, he twists it, and here's what he does. Once he deceives you, he leads you into disobedience. Now, I'm going to say something, and I wasn't going to, and I feel like the Lord wants me to. Here's one of the lies that is capturing a generation right now. We have this lie that somehow we want our children to think that what matters most is athletics, that what matters most in their life is that they have all the experiences, and so we'll pick our kids away from being in community because we don't want them to disappoint their team Instead of asking the question, maybe they're disappointing the Lord. And here's the hard part about this, and please don't hear this as a point of shame. It's that I think what happens for me included is like, oh, God's always going to be there. So we put him in our back pocket knowing that he is loving and gracious and kind and compassionate and slow to anger and quick in love. And, and so we sit there and we go, no, no, it's fine, it's fine. But what are we teaching our next generation of kids? Where is their dependence? Is their dependence on Jesus or on kids or people that they won't see in the next 10 years? There's nothing wrong with going to sports activities. There's nothing wrong with that. Not even wrong if like you have to miss an tournament. I get that. But are you instilling in your children the value that the real place is the community of Christ and it's found in Jesus? Or are you trying to tell them that their, their identity is formed in an activity? I believe that the Lord is challenging some things and we're seeing the direct result of a generation who right now, more people are leaving the church than coming to it. Are you aware of that? And you might say, well, Jesus, Jason, the church isn't, isn't Jesus. No, I get that. I agree with that. But guess what? This is the body of Christ. It's the primary place where people encounter Jesus. And where does it start? Well, generationally, every generation, every generation, you have a generation who loves Jesus less and less and less and less. It's funny. The Bible actually talks about that in the book of Judges. The book of Judges reminds us that if we forget the Lord, we forget what God has done. It doesn't just start with us, but then it gets passed down. And each generation walks further and farther away from the Lord. I'm tired of that. I hope you are. I want to see God do something new because I believe that what God wants to do is he wants us to realize the strategies of the enemy. Because once the enemy has deceived you, once you live in disobedience, he brings the ultimate, which is death. That's his ultimate goal. He wants to bring death to you. Death to your family line, death to your faith, death to your community. I want to invite the worship team back up here. Because as we come to this, here's what I want you to realize. Um, I, was, I was reading, and originally last week I was going to preach on John 10.10, 10, which says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you might have life and have it to it, its abundance. And, and for years, I don't know how I missed this. I really don't. I've taught this verse countless times, and I automatically assume Jesus is talking about Satan. Satan is the thief. He is the liar, the deceiver. He's the one who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And that's ultimately true. But in the context of the passage, do you want to know who he's actually challenging? The Pharisees. He's calling the religious leader. They were the thieves. The enemy had gotten a hold of them, just like the enemy got of the apostle, the apostle Peter. When Jesus told Peter, hey, I need to die, and Peter goes, I'll never let that happen. Here's the way the enemy works. The enemy works through people. Because he gets a hold of somebody else's heart and mind. How many of you have ever had, maybe, I mean, I'll be honest, maybe I said something this morning that offended you, and guess what? It's okay if God's word offended you. It's a problem if I did. If I did, I'm sorry. Um, 
But if it's God's word, sometimes truth hurts. Would you agree with that? How many of you have ever had truth spoken? You're like, ow. Nobody likes truth. Did you know in the armor of God, the way that we fight the devil's schemes, how we recognize strongholds, it starts off with the belt of truth. Not the belt of public opinion. Not the belt of social media. The belt of truth. Truth girds everything. And the hard part is, is sometimes truth hurts. And here's the thing. I want to invite you to stand with me. Here's what I want all of us to ask. Some of you in this room have bought into a lie. Actually, all of us have lies that we've bought into. Um, my house, the side of my house, we have this yard, right? But my backyard on the left side was a garden. I later discovered that this was really good ground for, for uh, farming. Here's the thing. I'm actually not very good at anything having to do with vegetation. I have a, a black thumb. I could kill a cactus. True story. And here's the thing. So it, we plowed it up last year and we tilled it and we did all the things and it looked really good and nice and it was great. And then we went away last weekend. Now there were a couple weeds. You guys all know where I'm going with this, don't you? There were a couple weeds. We go away Sunday, we come back Monday and all of a sudden what was here, the whole thing was filled and it was all this high. And I'm like, what the heck is going on? Where'd that come from? Here's the thing about lies. They start off as small seeds that get planted. See, what I didn't realize is that the seeds of the weed were already in the ground. Whether or not I saw them or not, they were already there. The effect of them came later. We all have lies, seeds that have been planted into us that could become and might become strongholds if we don't tend to them now. So here's what I want you to do. Instead of pointing at somebody else and saying, oh, you've believed a lie, you need truth. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to put your finger right here. Point it right here. Say, I need truth. I need you, Lord, to open my eyes. Reveal the lies. See, that's where it starts. It doesn't start by pointing it at somebody else. It starts here realizing that I've believed lies. That there are seeds in my life that are just waiting to rise up to strangle out faith and hope and love and a marriage and parenting and being the man that God has called me to be. We all have them. Next week, this week we talked about how do we recognize the strongholds. The strongholds are those lies we believed. Next week, we're going to talk about how do we capture our thoughts. How do we dig up those lies so that they no longer control us, but more importantly, how do they not affect a generation? Because I don't want my kids living in my lies. Do you? So here's what I want. If you're in a place where you need victory this morning, would you do me a favor? Would you just raise your hand? If you need victory, if there's a lie you're believing, a stronghold, keep it up. Don't let it down yet. I want you to hear this prayer. You don't need to say it with me. I just want you to receive this. Holy Spirit, I pray right now for every hand raised. God, you are the God of victory. You are the God who destroys strongholds and lies. And right now, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would give eyes to see for every hand raised, even those who are afraid to raise their hand. God, that you would reveal... Where are the seeds, the lies, the strongholds that are creeping up? Because God, we know that through the gospel of Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit and the power of God's word, that God, you can bring victory. So in Jesus' name, may it begin now. We want freedom. What do we want? Freedom. In Jesus' name, let us have freedom. Let's come and worship the Lord. Can we just give a thank you?